Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you would. We're going to continue our series tonight talking about being disconnected. And we saw the last two weeks uh, how that Adam and Eve were disconnected when we talked about being disconnected in paradise, which was the Garden of Eden. And then last week being disconnected on the east side of Eden as we uh, studied the life of Cain or the story of Cain and Abel and saw how that Cain ultimately had his relationship with God interrupted. And we want to, once again, in these Sunday evening services, in this family time service, we want to focus on characters in the Bible who had a relationship with God, but saw a disconnect uh, 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 come up or, or, or appear or happen in that relationship with God. And we want to learn from these individuals. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about being disconnected on earth. Now, that that's really covers a, a lot of people. It covers everyone, actually. And in the first two stories, we saw Adam and Eve specifically and how that their relation was dis, relationship was disconnected. And in the last uh, lesson, or the last story, Cain's relationship. But now we're talking about all of mankind, with the exception of this man who's mentioned in verse number 22 of Genesis 6, Noah. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives were exempt. But everyone else, everyone else on earth experienced a disconnect or were disconnected from God. Now, in the last two messages, really, we did the same thing that we're going to do tonight. And so I'm going to give you an outline that we followed, though I may not have specifically pointed this outline out to you. And I'll point it out tonight uh, in, in the course of the message. And this will be the outline we'll use each Sunday night. So each Sunday night as we take a story, as we have already, we're going to look at the situation of the individual. And then after that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about the separation that occurred between God and that individual. And then finally, we're going to look at the source of the disconnect. Or we're going to look at what the source was, why that disconnect happened, what was the wedge that got in there and caused this individual to be disconnected or to their relationship to be severed, the relationship that they had with God. And so tonight we're going to once again look at this story and notice these three things. So first off, starting off the message tonight, let's talk uh, about the uh, situation of mankind at this time. The Bible tells us back in verse number 1 of chapter 6, it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years." There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, tonight in the message, as we look at the situation, I will point out what it tells us here in verse number 2, but we're not going to emphasize it a whole lot, and we're not going to dissect it. It says, "...the sons of God saw the daughters of men." And it tells us that they saw the daughters of men and they took the daughters of men to be their wives. Now, this is a verse that we're not, as I said, we're not going to dissect, but I will go ahead and just address real briefly tonight. Uh, you can talk to a lot of Bible scholars and like so many other things, they may agree or disagree on this verse, just as the question of where did Adam's and Eve's sons get their wives? Uh, this is another one of those areas where honestly, we're probably not going to completely understand this verse and this, uh, this portion here of scripture until we get to heaven. But the sons of God is a term that's often referred to or used, I should say, in the Old Testament to refer to uh, the angels of God. Now, the Bible says here that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And in verse number one, it said that the, that man uh, began to multiply on the face of the earth and that daughters were born unto them. So there are people that believe that 
angels that rebelled against God and rebelled against God's order uh, left heaven, came to this earth. Uh, these would be demons. And ultimately that they took uh, the daughters of men because they saw them and that they had uh, uh, children with the daughters of men. Uh, they why, uh, married them and they had children with them. Now, once again, uh, this is one of those verses that really you can debate over. And I'm not going to debate with anyone about it. It really doesn't uh, change uh, salvation. It doesn't change what the Bible teaches on so many things. It's just one of those nuggets that's put in there and it makes you say, hmm, I wonder what that really means. And like I said, one day when we get to heaven, we'll find out for sure. But let me encourage you not to major on the minors because that's not the, the point of the message tonight. The point of the message is the situation of mankind at this time. It was good. If you notice the very first phrase in verse number one, it says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Now, you remember back to chapter number one, when God created Adam and then he created Eve, we're told that when God created them, male and female created he them, and we're told that a command was given to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So a command was given to them by God, be fruitful and multiply. Now we read for the very first time in uh, uh, the book of Genesis that man actually begins to multiply. You know, multiplication is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. In fact, whenever you read that word multiply in the word of God, uh, it is used in a positive connotation or in a positive way. Let me show you uh, just a couple examples of that. Turn over to Genesis chapter number 17 real quickly. Genesis chapter number 17 and verse number 2. Genesis chapter number 17 and verse number 2. Here the Bible says, tells us that the Lord appeared to Abram who later had his name changed to Abraham by God. And God tells him in verse 1, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Verse 2, And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So here the term multiply is used in a positive way to show that God's blessing was going to be upon Abram. Turn now to Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 17. Genesis 22 <clears throat> and verse number 17. By this point in time, Abram's name has now been changed to Abraham. And in verse number 15, we're told that an angel of the Lord was sent to Abraham and delivered this message. Verse 16, he says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So here, after going up to the top of the mountain that is known now as Jehovah Jireh, in verse 14 it's mentioned, uh, 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 the angel of the Lord is sent to Abraham to tell him, hey, because you went ahead and you were willing to offer your son, you were willing to give your son, God is going to bless you. And once again, the term multiply is used in a positive way. One last uh, example, and there are many more we could look at, but one last one, Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 24. Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 24. And this is another time when the Lord appeared and talked uh, here to uh, Isaac, uh, Abraham's son. The Bible says in Genesis 26, 24, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Now, as I said, we could look at many more, but those are just a few examples. If you do a word search in the Bible, using the, uh, looking up the word multiply, you will see that it is always positive. Now, going back to Genesis 6.1, here's the situation of mankind. It's a very positive situation. Mankind is being blessed by God. Mankind's multiplying. They're growing in number. And then all of a sudden, we, we come to this passage of Scripture where the Bible tells us in verse number 13 that God says to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So 
The situation is positive. It's good. Man, mankind is growing and being blessed and multiplying in number. And then, boom, all of a sudden, 13 uh, or 12 verses later, in verse number 13, God's ready to destroy all of mankind. And so we see the second thing in our outline tonight, the separation between God and mankind. What caused this separation? Well, if you look back to verse number 9 of this chapter, chapter 6, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. Now, in verse 9 and 10, we're told about Noah. We're told about him being just. And remember, we learned this morning that that's talking about him being upright, him being uh, uh, good or moral. And he has this testimony that he's just. He is perfect in his generations. He's walking with God. He has an excellent testimony. And then you have the contrast now in verse number 11. Noah's doing great. His wife's doing great. His three sons are doing great. Their wives are doing great. And then now let's look at the rest of the world. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Now, technically when you talk about years... Mankind has been on the earth for a number of years, for over a thousand years at this point. But still, for it to be filled with violence, the earth, for mankind to be extremely violent and corrupt already, just six chapters into its history, it tells you something. It goes on to say in verse number 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. Now remember that word corrupt means defiled. It was corrupt, it was defiled, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. I have it circled in my Bible. Verse number 12, the second phrase, for all flesh. Outside of Noah, his sons, uh, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, God looks down at the earth and he sees... That man who has multiplied, they haven't grown by addition, they've grown by multiplication. They're fulfilling the command that was given to Adam in the Garden of Eden by God. They have uh, become corrupt and they have become uh, uh, morally, uh, or immoral I should say. They have uh, ultimately become defiled and their way has become defiled as it said at the end of verse number 12. This is what caused the separation between God and man. Remember the verse that we should not fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness out of Ephesians chapter number 5. Well, God does not fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So God had to separate Himself from that sin. Thus He told Noah in verse number 13 what we already read. The end of all flesh is come before me. He knew that He was going to have to Destroy mankind. This separation had happened. Now, what really caused this? From verse number 1 where man's multiplying and really once again that multiplication is a sign of God's blessing to now where God has to separate Himself and bring judgment upon all of mankind. Well, that's the third, the third part of our outline is the source of the disconnect. When we look back here, we find in verse number 5 that the Bible tells us this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man of whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. The Bible tells us here that God looked and He saw that the imagination of the thoughts of mankind's heart was evil. It was evil continually. So what was the source of this disconnect? 
Why did mankind as a whole go from being blessed by God and multiplying to then being separated from God uh, and God having to say, you know what, you guys are defiled, you're corrupt, and I can't have any fellowship with you. And not only can I not have fellowship with you, I'm going to have to bring judgment upon you. What was the source of it? It was the thoughts of mankind. It was the thoughts of their hearts. Remember what Jesus said that when His disciples were accused of, uh, of being defiled because they had eaten with dirty hands. And Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of a man that defiles him. And He said that it's out of the heart that come murderers and en- murderings and envyings and all other sorts of sins. He was talking about the fact that Uh, A man does, as we talked about this morning, what he thinks about doing. How that there's that connection. If you ultimately let garbage into your mind and you dwell on garbage, then ultimately your actions are going to be garbage. They're going to be trash. And so uh, we see that this is what caused that disconnect. This was the source of the disconnect for all of mankind at this time. Now let me show you something real quickly here. And as we come to a close, because we talked this morning about the importance of making sure that we meditate on right things. And I don't want to go back and re-preach that whole message. You heard it. The majority of you did. And you understand what Paul said in Philippians 4, how that we need to think on those things that are true, that are honest, just, that are lovely, that are of good report. We need to think upon these things. Uh, but let me just point something out to you real quickly here. Now, we don't have time for you to look back to chapter number 5 and, and read all of chapter number 5, but I did this on my own. In chapter number 5, you have the lineage of Adam. Starting in verse number 1, it tells us, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female, created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And then it goes on in verse number 3 to start breaking, showing us the lineage of Adam. Now, Adam lived to be 130 years of, uh, of age before he and Eve had Seth, who was not their first son, but he was their son that continued on the lineage of Adam and Eve. We know Cain and Abel, what happened to them. So the Bible tells us Adam was 130 when they had Seth. Seth was 105 when, his, when he begat Enos. Enos was 90 when he begat Canaan. Canaan was 70 when he begat his son Mahaliel. Then Mahaliel uh, was 65 when he begat Jared. Jared was 162 when he begat Enoch. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. And Methuselah was 187 when he begat Lamech. And Lamech was 182 when he begat Noah. Now, interestingly enough, the Bible tells us that Noah was 500 years old when uh, the the Lord had uh, given him Shem, Ham, and Japheth at the end of chapter number 5. In verse 32, it says, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he's 500 years old. He has these three sons. The Bible tells us in chapter number 7, real quickly here, it tells us in uh, verse number 11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So when he was 600, it began to rain. When he's 601, the, the floods have subsided, the water has gone off the earth, he and his family leave the ark. Now real quickly, let me just point something out about Noah before I make this last uh, really bring out this last interesting thing about Noah and his family. Noah, it says, was a just man, and he was perfect, and he walked with God. How did he do this if everyone else around him was doing wrong? How did he do this? He had the right mind. He had the right thoughts. He had to meditate, as we talked about this morning, on holy things, on pure things. He had to meditate on the things of God. When everyone else around him, the overwhelming majority, 
were corrupt and defiled because the thoughts of their, uh, their minds and of their hearts were evil continually. Noah made sure and he made, that his thoughts were right, that he and, uh, he and his wife, that they taught it to their boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, to make sure that they kept their thoughts right. And ultimately, because their thought life was right, their life was right or their actions were right. Now, interestingly enough, going back to chapter number 5, Noah does right. Everybody else around him is doing wrong, right? As we saw already in, in the verses this evening. Did you know that Methuselah was 187, as I said, when he begat Lamech? But ultimately, he lived to uh, 782 more years after he begat Lamech. So he lived to be 969 years of age. He lived to be five, he lived five years longer than his son. His son Lamech lived 777 years. So Methuselah is 187. His wife gives birth to Lamech. And then Lamech lives to be 777. But his dad lives 782 years after his birth, five years after him. So Lamech passes on, and Methuselah ultimately dies at 900, five years after his son at 969 years of age. Now, if you do the math, and we don't have time to look at it tonight, I, I did it on my own earlier this week, but if you do the math, you'll find out that Methuselah died when Noah was 600 years of age. Now, think about that for a second, because Methuselah is a man that we point out a lot as being a godly man. He lived to be 969 years of age, yet he wasn't on the ark. Now, maybe he died before the rain started to come because the Bible tells us that the rain didn't come until the second month of Noah's 600 year of living. But even if, even if for some reason, Methuselah did do right, uh, or even if, even if he was, uh, excuse me, even if he died a, a little bit before that, before Noah and his family got on the ark and before the rain started coming, think about that. Here's Noah who has his father and his grandfather who fall into this category of being men who were corrupt. Men who didn't have thoughts that honored and glorified God. Now Noah could have easily fallen into that same trap. He could have said, well, my family's wicked, my family's ungodly. By the way, you ever wonder why God took Enoch? Maybe it's because Enoch only lived to be 365 years of age. I wouldn't be surprised if we get to heaven if it's because God didn't want Enoch to have to be burdened or vexed by all that was going to transpire from the time of his taking until the time that Noah built the ark and mankind was destroyed. Uh, Noah could have easily given in and said, you know what, the rest of my family, they, they don't really think righteously. They don't think godly. You know what, I mean... They sort of listen to this music and, and they watch these ungodly things and they think about and, and talk about these ungodly things. I, I guess it won't be a bad thing for me to do too if everybody else is doing it. But no, Noah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And in verse number 8 it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he did what was right when nobody else on earth was doing what was right. He did what was right even when family members of his were not doing right. He did not allow himself to be corrupt. He had the right mindset. He thought on the right things. And so while everybody else was disconnected from God, he stayed connected with God. And he was able to go through probably one of the most treacherous things to live through, the flooding of all mankind. Could you imagine being in that ark? And hearing the rain coming down. And hearing maybe even people beating on the side of that ark as the rain starts getting higher and higher. And knowing that some of those people may have been family members of yours, or at least friends of yours, people that acquaintances of yours. But he had to do what God told him to do. In verse number 22 where we read, it said that he did according to all that God commanded him. Why didn't he question God? Why didn't he doubt God? Because his mind was right. His thoughts were right. His thoughts were godly thoughts. God's way is better than man's way. And he kept his thoughts right. And his thoughts molded his actions. And his actions lined up with the Lord. 
and with what God wanted for him and for his life. This week, once again, as we talked about this morning, we need to make sure that we don't get disconnected from God. And Satan is going to try to get into your mind this week, and he is going to try to affect your thought life, and he is going to try to get you to doubt God, and he is going to try to get you uh, uh, to question God. Don't give in to those attacks. Make sure that you're spending time, as we've already talked about, strengthening your walk with God through the Bible, through prayer, and ultimately through meditating on the right things so that when others give in and others falter and fail and are corrupted, you still are going forward for the cause of Christ. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for all that You've done for us. Thank You for all that You've given to us. Lord, I pray that